thank you all for joining us this afternoon for our panel on Turkey-China relations and specifically on the question of whether Turkey will continue to keep its silence in the face of Beijing's genocidal repression of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, what the Uyghurs themselves refer to as East Turkestan. In 2009, the then Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan condemned Beijing's violent crackdown on mass ethno-religious protests and systematic cruelty against Uyghurs as a genocide. Turks have deep historical and cultural ties to the Uyghurs, a Turkic Muslim people who have for decades been subjected to harsh communist rule in China. The Republic of Turkey was once firmly aligned with Western democracies in the Cold War struggle against communist totalitarianism. And since the 1950s, Turkey was a refuge for thousands of Uyghur asylum seekers who fled Chinese communist repression. Over 50,000 Uyghurs, according to some estimates, now live in Turkey, mainly in Istanbul. And any visitor to that great city would see that it has been a place where Uyghurs are free to live as Uyghurs unlike in their homeland of East Turkestan. But this has been changing under President Erdogan. Since he became president in 2014, the mercurial Erdogan has fundamentally shifted Turkey's core geopolitical orientation. Some say to a more nationalist and Islamist orientation, but I would say a more anti-Western and Eurasianist one. Moreover, Beijing, as Beijing has ratcheted up its repression of Uyghurs and the situation in Xinjiang has become a real ongoing genocide. Erdogan has joined the autocratic rulers of Iran, Saudi Arabia and other key Muslim states in defending, if not actively abetting the PRC's conduct and bid to sub subjugate the Uyghurs. What accounts for this stark reversal in Turkey's stance toward the PRC and its cruelty? Today, the complicity of the Erdogan government and the Turkish media that it controls in China's genocidal conduct is facing growing pushback from nationalist and Islamic groups in the Turkish opposition. In years ahead, how will this affect Turkish politics and Turkey-China relations? Will the Turkish government maintain its silence and acquiesce in Beijing's repression and other plans in the Middle East? Or will Turkey stand with its former Western allies and assert itself to hold Beijing to account for its crimes against humanity. I'm joined by two well-known and insightful commentators, uh, Mustafa Akyol, who is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, where he focuses on the intersection of public policy, Islam, and modernity. A lot of folks know Mustafa from his insightful and trenchant analyses in the New York Times and many other world newspapers where he's covered politics and religion throughout the Muslim world. He is the author of several books, most recently in 2021, a book that I very much enjoyed, Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, Freedom, and Tolerance. I'm also joined by my Hudson colleague, Nuri Turkle, who's a senior fellow, a corporate lawyer, and a longtime Uyghur American civic leader. He is chair of the Indispensable Uyghur Human Rights Project, and in May of last year, uh, two years ago, he was appointed to be a commissioner on the Indispensable U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Thank you both for being here. I look forward to this conversation. Mustafa, we, we'll start with you. You had written uh, an essay that's going to be appearing very soon in my journal, Current Trends, in which you explain how China has been able to influence, you describe it as co-opt, the current Turkish government to mute its advocacy for the Uyghurs. Why is Turkey particularly important on this issue and how over time has Chinese influence in Turkey grown? Thank you so much, uh, Eric, for your kind introduction and for uh, actually inviting me to write that article uh, at the Hudson uh, Magazine. Uh, I, I wanted to write about Turkey and Uyghurs because as a Turk myself and who's, who's grown up in Turkey and especially known Turkey's Islamic and national circles very well, uh, there is something that really bothers me and puzzles me. Actually, not that puzzles anymore because I get what, what's happening, but there's something that, let's say, bothers me uh, in the past couple of years, and that is the genocidal repression of the Uyghurs by the Chinese regime has become a global 
phenomenon. It's a global issue, right? I mean, governments are condemning China over this, rightly so. People are protesting the Olympics and uh, government after government are passing resolutions. If I think that's the right thing to do because I know there's something horrific going on in the camps and the uh, in, in the totalitarian control system that China uh, established in the region, destroying mosques and imprisoning people just because they are pious Muslims or, or proud of their heritage. Now, while this is happening, so much uh, reaction to this coming is from not just governments, maybe governments are less important, but actually NGOs, human rights groups that are really dedicated on a principled basis for human rights in the world. My own country, Turkey, has been incredibly almost silent or very polite about this issue. I'm speaking of the government, governmental stance. And in Turkey, the government is too important because it controls 90% of the media today. And a lot of NGOs, which are actually gongos, if you will, like government organized or organizations. And uh, this is bizarre because Turkey has been the hub of the Uyghur cause, the base of the Uyghur cause for decades. I mean, I grew up in Turkey. I know in the 90s, the oppression of Uyghurs by China was a recurrent theme, especially in the nationalist and Islamic circles, which are the very circles which should be close to President Erdogan today, and some of them are still supportive. So Erdogan represents that actually camp in Turkey. In 1995, when the Uyghur, historic Uyghur leader, Isa Yusuf Abdekin, died, he was buried with state ceremony and his, his, his was, parks were given his name. So people know about this in Turkey more than anybody else. And as you said, that's why when in, for example, 2009, when uh, the Chinese regime had a brutal crackdown on uh, the riots in Urumqi, uh, Erdogan condemned China for genocide. Actually, at that point, it wasn't genocide, it was state brutality. It's good that he spoke out, but uh, you know, Erdogan is using a very strong language, sometimes more than necessary in, in such incidents, because he wants to be the defender of the oppressed, especially oppressed Muslims. And okay, that was good that he spoke out then. But what is happening since 2016 and became very apparent by 2017, the camps, I mean, the whole genocidal wave started with Xi Jinping is way beyond what happened in 2009. But the same Erdogan, President Erdogan, has said nothing on this issue so far. I mean, let's be fair. Turkish authorities did speak politely and carefully on this issue, actually better than some of the states in, in, in the Arab world who have said nothing and even, even praised China. I mean, there was a statement by the Turkish foreign ministry in 2009. That was the first thing, actually. That it, it raised some concern, which was a good statement. A uh, little after a government spokesman spoke, spoke about this and the Turkish foreign minister two times said, we are sharing our sensitivities and concerns with our Chinese partners, you know, when he has a meeting with them. So they're trying to say, we, we, we know this, we're caring about this and we're talking to the Chinese about this. But at the same time, we know that, I mean, this is one thing, this is a very careful language compared to what the same government can say on other issues, especially when condemning Western powers or uh, condemning French for Islamophobia or Israel or any other uh, power that is not, you know, China or Russia. Uh, that, that's very clear. Second, the Turkish government, as I explained in my piece, did a very careful job of suppressing news in the Turkish media about the camps and about the persecution of Uyghurs. And it is amazing that the Turkish foreign minister himself promised to the Chinese that these, these news would be suppressed back in a press conference in Beijing in 2017. So he said, we will not allow any news against China in Turkey. And they did not allow any news against China for a long time. And I think by 2019, they started to shift a little bit and some, uh, I think, uh, statements came, but because the Turkish opposition was uh, pursuing this issue and Turkish opposition, that's E-Party, that is Saadet Party. So these are parties that present the Islamic or national sentiments, but they are not in line with the government there in the opposition. They started to really bring this issue and, and there was more recognition. So the government had to allow a little bit news and say a few things. Uh, but this is disappointing. And uh, Turkey, in my view, should have been leader, the global leader of the Uyghur cause because of the trust that Uyghurs have to Turkey. What we have seen is that rather a few statements here and there, we've seen protests by Uyghur activists in Turkey cracked down by the police. 
uh, we've seen uh, news suppressed. We have seen even news, as I mentioned there, uh, about all this is fake propaganda and Uyghurs are doing perfectly fine. That appeared in the pro-government Turkish media. Uh, and even just a few months ago, Turkey's flagship of the pro-government media empire. I mean, I say it like one of the 20 proud does, but the biggest one, <laughs> Sabah, Daily Sabah, published a one-page advertisement saying the glorious history of the Chinese Communist Party and its, its vision for the Turkish partnership and so on and so forth. Well, you don't do that if you really care about the Uyghurs. Um, so unfortunately... I'm writing this partly because maybe they they can feel a little bit embarrassed and you know and I think more people we, we should pressure because Turkey should have been and I think the people in Turkey know about this there is a growing uh, opposition there there are report we will we will speak about those but basically Turkey should have been the leader of the cause and it it has not been and the reason is because of its strategic shift from away from western democracies to more authoritarian regimes that is China and Russia Unfortunately, President Erdogan and his team began to see their future on that side and not, not the liberal democratic side. And that strategic uh, shift, a, a huge shift, because that's turning Turkey's direction after 150 years. It's not fully done yet, but it is going towards that direction. And it's concerning. Uh, that uh, brought the uh, need to be silent and inoffensive and, and to China to polite to China. And China has been able to co-opt Turkey using this leverage. Yeah. Nori, I mean, I'll posit what Mustafa just said. I mean, how, in your view, have closer ties between China and the Erdogan government affected uh, Uyghurs living in Turkey and of course the larger Uyghur struggle to restore their rights? Um, there have been reports, as Mustafa had alluded to, that Turkey has cracked down on activist networks in Turkey, um, that they were in fact extraditing like a lot, a lot of other states in the Middle East, uh, Uyghur activists through third states back to the PRC. Yeah. Um, there are uh, uh, reports as well of prominent uh, Uyghur leaders that have been barred from entering Turkey. Uh, what are the concerns uh, amongst uh, the Uyghur activist community and, and others uh, about, about this? Well, th thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you for bringing us together, uh, organizing this uh, timely conversation. And I'm profoundly grateful uh, to Mustafa uh, for his uh, uh, willingness to share his um, uh, expertise and unique perspective on this issue through his past writings and um, public remarks. Um, I'm very grateful in my um, um, personal capacity as well as my professional capacity. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Um, the Uyghur people, um, uh, both inside Turkey and outside Turkey, have been uh, disappointed that this country once promoted as a model democracy uh, for its remarkable uh, success in early parts of the AKP uh, ruling. Now, uh, essentially uh, come to the level of China uh, ba based on a, a German uh, research uh, uh, report. Uh, Turkey now ranks about ranks at the bottom of 20 countries, uh, very close to the Chinese when it comes to democratic freedom. That is uh, one aspect, uh, one piece to it. And the other is uh, the, the major U-turn that the Erdogan regime took since 2016 in particular, starting with uh, rounding up um, a Uyghur activists, uh, namely this individual that China is so keen to uh, uh, take back, Abdukadir uh, Yajan, based in Istanbul. He still does not uh, have any legal status in Turkey. He's been out, but he spent several years behind bars. And then in 2017, uh, Chinese uh, signed, um, uh, China and Turkey signed an agreement uh, allowing extradition. Uh, even the purported offenses is only illegal in one of the two countries. It's very loose end uh, agreement. And uh, it makes it quite clear that the China wants to use this to grab anyone uh, from the Turkish um, uh, state just like the way that they have been successfully in Central Asia. That is also, uh, that is one uh, a turning point. And then starting 2019, um, 
as Mustafa pointed out, um, there have been rounding up, rounding up uh, Uyghur uh, residents in Turkey and sending them to um, deportation centers uh, and making the matter worse uh, based on credible reports, based on the estimate included in the recent uh, court filing by Turkish citizens of Uyghur origin in Turkey that there are about 200 Turkish citizens currently languishing in Chinese concentration camps. And the uh, Turkish government has not uh, raised it, uh, cases. Uh, I don't know even if they have acknowledged uh, publicly. And also um, uh, in order to address um, uh, some of the concerns, um, it's apparent that the Turkish government um, have been uh, joining the US led effort at the United Nations, uh, including uh, last summer's uh, public uh, virtual event where Turkish ambassador came to speak uh, along with other Western democracies, which was very well received uh, and did not, a sky did not fall on Turkey for doing that. Um, and now what is uh, more disturbing is that uh, Turkish, uh, Turkey-based Uyghur residents have been subject to family separation and, and in most gruesome uh, uh, situation that I have you know, encountered uh, that uh, Uyghur parents have recognized their children, missing children who were taken into the uh, children's camps uh, through the uh, Chinese state-run propaganda materials. And there's no, uh, does not appear to have any shift um, uh, in the current trend line in the Turkish government's uh, thinking. Uh, and also as Mustafa pointed out, there's a lot of whataboutism. Uh, American imperialists uh, created this saga in order to uh, control China rise type of uh, message is, is uh, uh, kind of narrative is still quite popular. Um, and Uyghurs are in dilemma. Uh, the Uyghur people, both in Europe and the United States, uh, because of the cultural, historical, uh, uh, religious ties to the Turkish people. Um, and they also do know the uh, difference between uh, the Turkish government and Turkish people. They're not quite comfortable publicly condemning Turkey. They're afraid that it may hurt the well being of uh, those uh, stateless uh, Uyghurs in Turkey. They, at the same time, uh, kind of mildly expressing this disappointment, suggesting, look, some of the well-known established Uyghur activists who even studied in, Tur in Turkey, including Dolkun Isak, who are not allowed to uh, enter Turkey, but yet you allow some uh, questionable individuals or individuals with a violent uh, history uh, through the state uh, position or individual position allowed to be entered the uh, Turkish uh, 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 soil. Uh, that is that is not acceptable. So it has been expressed, but it's not really created the type of um, uh, uh, interest, maybe possibly policy shift yet. But I, based on the um, the ongoing economic, um, technological, energy specific uh, cooperation between China and Turkey, we can discuss a little bit further um, uh, in details later. But. I don't think that the current trend line will uh, change. Uh, and I believe that the Uyghurs will continue to be disappointed. The United States Congress is um, considering a special visa status, immigration status for the Uyghur refugees in Turkey. Once that, is, um, uh, once that becomes a law, uh, once that um, receives uh, the endorsement from leadership, we may have some uh, humanitarian uh, assistance, tangible humanitarian assistance to the Uyghur refugees in Turkey, but that's only humanitarian aspect. We have not really figured out how to address the diplomatic, economic, technological uh, aspect of China-Turkey relations. We'll come back to that. Thank you, Nori. Um, Mustafa, do you agree with Nori? Um, I mean, we've talked quite a bit and you've written very clearly about the growing uh, opposition to Erdogan's silence, uh, which is coming both from nationalist movements as well as Islamic groups. We've seen prominent Turkish politicians from Miral Akshanar to Ahmed Davutoglu, the former foreign minister and former ally of Erdogan's, criticize his government's silence. Do you think as uh, the election season gets underway in Turkey, 
and it's possible we could have snap elections, although it's likely going to be happening next year. Do you think we can expect a change of tone, if not of policy, from the Turkish government in the future? Uh, well, I agree with Nuri, and I'm also thankful to Nuri's uh, remarks about uh, my work on this. Uh, we spoke about this issue three years ago with Nuri on a platform at the Cato okay. Institute. It was actually one of the early events on this, uh, I okay. think, in the American uh, intellectual landscape. Now, uh, and I, I'm, I'm proud that, you know, uh, to be a friend of Nuri, who's really the leader, uh, I think, uh, one of the key leaders on this uh, issue, uh, burning human rights issue in the world. Um, will, can Turkey change? I think, for, I mean, first of all, can government change in Turkey? So that's a big question and people have different opinions about that. But if the current system continues in Turkey, the current government, and you could even call it regime in the sense that it's just not a government, but control is something that controls the judiciary, big chunk of the media and, and a lot of uh, finances and everything. Uh, if this continues, I think what we'll see is the more of the same in which Turkey will say, well, we have some concerns we're sharing with our Chinese friends with those, but we have important relations with China. Uh, so it will not, maybe the pressure from society will make Turkey uh, speak a bit more louder here and there. But I don't see Turkey coming up against China because they are on a track of distancing themselves from the Western alliance. Uh, because I, and the reason is they don't see themselves fitting into that political model. I mean, if you establish a party state, you sympathize with the party states in the world. And especially if they're alluring you towards their side, which is also the case, I think, with Russia and uh, and China, and of course, Turkish government or its or its propagandists are saying this is independence. Turkey is becoming full independent now, finally in the independence. Whereas I think it's what they're developing is dependence on China and, and Russia, especially China. Uh, that's why they cannot, you know, speak speak on this issue. Now, one thing, the silver lining here, as you pointed out, Eric, is the Turkish opposition. And uh, different elements in the Turkish opposition. There's the secular main opposition, CHP, which has been actually more vocal on this issue than the AKP, but also to a few other parties. That is E Party. That's the good party, as it's called. That's a new opposition party in Turkey that represents mainstream Turkish nationalism. And I have some reservations with on their stances on Syrian refugees here and there. But I think on the Uyghur issue, issue they have taken a bold stance uh, and. Uh, and it's their leader, Meral Akshener, who's a successful, charismatic female politician, has brought a survivor of the camps to the Turkish parliament and made her speak, you know, an Uyghur victim. And the parliament TV stopped broadcast right at that moment. The parliament TV controlled by the government, of course. So there's this bizarre uh, effort by the powers that be not to offend China and to be not, you know, provoking the Chinese reactions. But e Party also recently published a report and I tweeted about it. And I think it's the most significant publication in a Muslim majority country on the Uyghur genocide, I think. It's, it's, uh, it's, it is written by a team of four uh, activists, uh, analysts. One of them is uh, in Ankara and I spoke to him and uh, we also had a, this, uh, he also is now appearing in the Turkish TVs. Uh, that that report with interviews with camp survivors really put what it is, and that is coming uh, to the public attention. Opposition party, Gelecek Partisi or Future Party by former Erdogan ally Ahmed Davutoglu, who was a prime minister. He's actually now in the opposition, and he blames the government for corruption, nepotism, which is all true. Uh, he's also quite vocal, and he called on the Turkish government to boycott the Uyghur, uh, boycott the Beijing uh, Olympics uh, to, for solidarity. Now, that is not something you see in all Muslim-majority countries. Like in Pakistan, already nobody speaks about this because nobody wants to offend China. They all see their China as their friend. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Turkey, at least the opposition is quite vocal on this, and that is something you know positive on the table. Um, now, the question is, can opposition come to power in Turkey? So if, if that happens, I think Turkey will have a shift again, hopefully towards the Western side a bit more, towards the liberal democratic side a bit more, I can say. Um, uh, they would have some, even the opposition would have some disagreements with here and there on Syria, this and that, but 
uh, that would change the tone. But and we have elections in Turkey uh, scheduled for 2023 uh, summer, like I think June. So that's the big elections. But everybody, the question that is on the minds of every Turkey observer is that will elections still matter to the extent that they can change government? And, and, and if, the, if this current government loses in an election, will it really respect those results or not? Now, I don't think there is a clear cut answer to this because uh, as Nuri said, Turkey has become quite authoritarian, unfortunately, in the past decade, going down Hill, as our also report in the Cato Freedom, Human and Freedom Index by the Cato Institute shows, going downhill in freedom of press, you know, individual rights, uh, rule of law in many, uh, many areas that we associate with democracy. But still, actually, elections in Turkey are something, right? Still, elections have been so far meaningful. And that's why the government, for example, lost Istanbul and Ankara to the opposition uh, parties in 2019. But there is also the fear that maybe that last thing that looks like a democracy will be also ditched at some point. It's not easy because Turkey is a country that is used to having uh, uh, elections, but nobody has a clear cut answer on this. Uh, so I would hope to see an election victory in the next elections. Let's also not forget though, Still, by the way, I mean, the government, Erdogan's party and his, uh, his ally, still some controls 40% of the electorate. So it's not also nothing, right? I mean, so there is a chance that he could, they could even win, you know, with the right conditions, with, uh, with the right amount of propaganda and a little bit crises. And when you bring everything, if you can master those things, you could even win. So, so uh, I think it is, it would be wrong to say this government will never go and it's done deal. That would be, I think, a very gloomy scenario. But there are, uh, and I think the Turkish opposition should play its hand very wisely so that they both win, which is not easy. Second, uh, they manage a crisis that might come after, after that win. Uh, and uh, the Turkish opposition <laughs> has its own problems, its own disunity and, uh, so it's a it's a complicated picture, but if they somehow come to power, I think Turkey stands on the uh, persecution, the genocide of Uyghurs. I think will be a more principled, uh, more uh, more more righteous one. To complement uh, Mustafa's point, I think this is actually this should be a, uh, a this should have present uh, this should be taken as an opportunity for the Turkish uh, government or Erdogan regime. Because they, there, there are uh, no, they don't have a long list of friends, unlike the past. Um, speaking out or taking a similar position on the Uyghur genocide as the United States and uh, Western liberal democracies will actually help Erdogan to get back to the position that Turkey enjoyed uh, traditionally, historically. And number one, number two, uh, Turkey may have used this as an opportunity also to uh, show its leadership role to the Central Asian uh, states. Recently, he hosted uh, Organization of Turkic States uh, Summit. Uh, it was uh, it, by and large a showcase, but some specifics is missing that no one said anything as to the fact and what and if the if if they do anything uh, about uh, what I call China threat in the region. And then three, uh, the United States uh, have just enacted uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Uh, this will pressure the businesses um, in China, the Western businesses, either to stop the forced labor practices because it's, it is illegal now, uh, presumptively anything made in, uh, made in East Turkestan, Xinjiang, are uh, made by enslaved Uyghurs unless proven other, otherwise. So these companies also have a choice to relocate and Turkey would be a really good place uh, for some of the industries, particularly the automobile industry, uh, textile industry to relocate. Uh, strategically, geographically, Turkey would be a very good place to invite uh, uh, bring these businesses to Turkey. It will solve its economic problems. It will bring Turkey closer to the West, to the United States. And also it will uh, present itself 
helped it help it helps to present itself as a leader solving some of the global pressing global issues um, and one um, other thing that i think that people are not talking enough about turkey is how much chinese technology has been uh, used uh, in the ongoing uh, strategic approach to Turkey. Traditionally, Chinese approach to Middle Eastern Muslim countries, particularly uh, in the Gulf countries, been uh, oil or selling weapons. With, uh, with respect to China, that, uh, Turkey, that, had, that was not the case, but it's broader, uh, in the broader sense of China's geopolitical interests, now it's folded into the Belt and Road Initiative. So Turkey could either help or hurt uh, China's uh, dream to be realized in this aspect. And finally, um, Turkey is also missing something very important, which is those uh, individuals, including their close to around 200 citizens who are languishing in Chinese concentration camps, been to Turkey where we take up a citizenship at the uh, encouragement of Erdogan in 2012, uh, was starting 2009 and 2012, uh, there were uh, a, a process for Uyghurs to take up a citizenship. And since his first trip to China through Urumqi with Ahmad Dawdole in 2012, which I wrote a column, uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal to phrase him for doing that, kind of opened the door for the Uyghurs uh, to go to Turkey for travel. It was so easy to get a passport, e-visa. And most of those people who traveled to Turkey bought properties, start a business, vice versa, and, uh, taking the assets to Urumqi to start new business, they have disappeared in the concentration camps. Turkey was one of the 26 countries that China uh, co considers a hostile country that includes the United States, Germany, uh, all of the stands in Central Asia. Uh, for anyone with a travel history uh, to those 26 countries, by and large taken, have taken into the uh, concentration camps. So Turkey promoted um, uh, culture, its movies, uh, language, music, um, a trade relationship since 2012. And now those people who are ad admire the Turkish culture, taken up a Turkish business model uh, in a, a shop ownership style, now disappeared. So uh, this, this is also adds another uh, uh, injury uh, the soul, uh, this adds salt to the injury that we has already been uh, uh, somewhat uh, 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 saddened to see uh, in the way that, that uh, Turkey is even failing to protect their own citizens caught up in this concentration camp network. Mustafa, picking up on that, there's been a lot of criticism of Erdogan coming from the opposition that the reason for his regime's silence on this is because of what you alluded to earlier, economic dependency on China. Um, there's been a concern amongst a lot of Turkey watchers here in the United States that as Erdogan comes under greater oppositional pressure from within, that he will look to China to help uh, buoy his political prospects and his regime. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And really, this is a question for both of you. I mean, how much is this uh, dependency on China and on Chinese finance and Chinese technology a real factor in Turkish politics going forward? Mm -hmm. We'll start with Mustafa first. Uh, Eric, I mean, there's certainly a economic dependency and hopes for new uh, economic benefits from China in the future. But I will say that's not the only thing. There's also an ideological, I think, element here. And, and right. sometimes people take ideology, ideology lightly, saying, you know, everything boils down to economics. Well, I think ideologies matter. And what, is, what I've seen in, in the Turkish landscape, uh, that is pro-government landscape in the past five years, is a what I would call occidentalism. I mean, it's the, it's the mirror image of orientalism. Like, the West is evil. All the evil comes from the West, and and everything that is non-Western is good for somehow. And uh, so China, you know, uh, I mean, the, there are Western conspiracies against our nation. Why are why is there opposition groups? Oh, it's Soros is behind them. You know, like CIA is behind them. So this ideology has been been has pump has been pumped to the public, and I think a lot of people really believe in that. You can see this in the pro-government media all the time. 
which has made them not believe in the reports in the Western media or Western NGOs about China. When China said, this is all Western propaganda, these are lies, they were ready to believe in that. At least they were ready to sell that to their, to their audience, even if they knew that. So there is that ideological element. And that's why, interestingly, for example, people outside of Turkey may not be familiar with that, but what we have seen in the past five years in Turkey is the, the rise of a bizarre political Turkish movement the movement of Turkish Maoists. Right. Uh, it's, there's a little party in Turkey called the Homeland Party uh, by, led by a guy named Do Perinçek. Right. And Do Perinçek is the founder of Turkish Maoism. I mean, he was in the 70s, I'm, I'm going to remember where he was like, there were the Leninists and Maoists fighting each other and there were, Stalin. There were all kinds mm -hmm. of communist groups. So um, Perinçek made a name as the bastion and beacon of Maoism. And then he kept that ideology and then he's emphasizing Maoism not too much. Now it's pat patriotism, but always patriotism against America and, and the West. And of course, China is our great ally. And Perinçek has become a key element. I mean, he's on pro-government TVs all the time. He actually said, we're helping the government see the world better and so on and so forth. He doesn't have a big movement, but the fact that a person like that at a party like that has become influential in this new Turkey tells you a lot about the, the ideological element there as well, which is combined with, you know, uh, with ideology. And I think the reason why Turkey went to Russian missiles is also partly because of the distrust of, of the West and NATO and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's another thing that's uh, that has been going on. Now, Will, the, the one question is, how does it look for Moscow and Beijing? Like, are they, when they look at Ankara, do they want to somehow use this, you know, ideological environment in Turkey and, the, and this, the, this, this enchantment with the West to their advantage? Now, I'm not an expert on the policies of Russia and China, but what I see in the media and, and in the past several years is that uh, they're trying to lure Turkey to their side to some extent. I mean, Putin certainly did that uh, because they're telling Turkey that, you know, like, here's a better world. There's a brand new world here. Come join us. I mean, I, and that for Putin, for Russia, that will be really a big dent in the Western alliance. And for Beijing, I think it is important to silence Turkey on the Uyghurs like other Muslims, because if Turkey doesn't say anything on this, which is historically the leader of the Uyghur cause, it will be also an important thing to, uh, to uh, it, it, will, it will be a leverage for keeping other Muslim countries in, in check as well. Now, this brings to your question, will China even go to the level of, because of this, trying to uh, help this government survive at the time of an economic decline? Uh, and, and economic, you know, financial collapse to some extent because the Turkish lira uh, went down dramatically uh, because of some pseudoscience that President Erdogan really believes. I wrote about that uh, recently. And uh, it is possible. I mean, I can't say that they can do this, but I think uh, one thing is interesting in Turkey today. We are going towards elections. And unlike in some other countries, it's not certain that the president always win 99%. So, I mean, Turkey is not there. I mean, Turkey has been a electoral democracy and people really vote and votes are really counted in Turkey. But President Erdogan, like all of us, sees that there's a risk of losing the next election. So it is quite possible that he might try to do everything in his hands to uh, increase his popularity. And that can, of course, include a miraculous economic boom right before the elections. And if he goes to uh, to knock some doors in Beijing uh, for that, it is possible. I can't say that's necessarily going to happen, but it is a possible scenario. And I checked on this a few people in Turkey, and they said, "Well, it's it's it doesn't sound incredible. It it, it could be the case, but it has to be seen." Hmm. Nori, what advice would you have for our government and for other Western democracies like Germany and the UK? on how to deal with Mr. Erdogan's government right now and uh, Turkey writ large? I, I, would, I would say that, um, you know, we have to, again, uh, talk about how successful uh, China has been uh, getting this Muslim majority countries on their side. Um, the, the elephant in the room is obviously Uyghurs. Uh, as you know, uh, Turkey said something in mild term, but their countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, 
Pakistan, even Palestine, taking the Chinese side. Only uh, Albania and Kosovo joined um, the efforts led by uh, Western democracies at the UN, uh, but others are actually doing the bidding for uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, case in point, MBS, after his visit to Beijing, he phrases the uh, CCP for its treatment of uh, the Uyghur Muslims, even though um, uh, his religion, uh, his way of uh, life, uh, similar, somewhat similar to the Uyghurs in a religious perspective, uh, likened to a thought virus, a mental illness, he was fine with it. Um, why do I bring this up? Um, the China has been investing a lot of time diplomatically, economically, and otherwise uh, to buy out silence in uh, these Muslim countries. Uh, in Turkey, just Turkey alone, since 2016, uh, the, uh, Beijing signed, uh, I think, around 10 uh, bilateral agreement, has provided uh, big checks um, for infrastructure projects. Uh, last year alone, uh, sorry, 2020 alone, the Chinese export uh, credit insurance company gave the Ch uh, Turkish um, wealth fund uh, $5 billion. And China is also investing on, in Turkey's uh, energy sector. You know, when Xi Jinping said that, well, we'll stop funding the coal powered uh, uh, energy plants, that, that is not true. Uh, when he said that at the UN, people were clapping hands and just jumped straight uh, to give him a lot of credit. But Turkey is one of the countries that China funds uh, coal, coal powered uh, energy plants. And also the technology, as I mentioned, this is another big issue that uh, Turkish people are ignoring. The uh, arrival of Huawei and ZTE immersed in the Turkish uh, surveillance, uh, 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 telecommunication sector, uh, defense technology uh, is, is, uh, has a huge ramifications in the future because it will affect the national security of Turkey, the privacy. So the reason I brought this up is that just to illustrate how successful, how strategic uh, that China has been uh, in its effort to change the counter of those uh, countries, including Turkey. And the United States and Western uh, democracies have not done nearly enough, even in the public diplomacy aspect. Um, I think that uh, the uh, United States and Europe uh, should consider picking up uh, something uh, that are in the interest of economic interest of uh, this uh, alliance. Um, uh, the United States have taken a position, uh, imposed several uh, tangible um, and um, uh, critical uh, policy steps. But the Europe, while recognizing the issues, and particularly forced labor supply chain issues, have not really addressed this. I think they should invite Turkey to join the effort. When uh, Biden, uh, President Biden uh, was attending G7, he managed to have the G7 countries to uh, pledge that uh, yeah. there will be no to forced labor produced products. And uh, this has been brought up at the G20. Uh, this has been also brought up at the uh, European uh, summit. So I think that uh, Europeans, instead of um, uh, pushing Turkey towards Russia and China, they should create an atmosphere environment to give a little bit of confidence to those uh, uh, politicians in Turkey uh, who may have otherwise uh, disapproved the uh, approach taken by Erdogan to uh, join the effort. Uh, this is actually win-win for the West and Turkey because the China threat, uh, Russia threat are real. And this is gonna change uh, the international uh, system uh, if we don't take this seriously. Uh, and this will effect effectively will alter the way of life um, if this um, digital authoritarianism is allowed to uh, metastasize, if we allow the Chinese to continue to use uh, slave labor produced products to pollute global supply chain. And we also will be in a big trouble if we allow Beijing to manipulate uh, politics, uh, domestic policies, foreign policies of a countries otherwise uh, should have their own independent and uh, free uh, independent policy approaches free of uh, China's influence operations. Thanks, Mustafa. I mean, you, you and I have, have both uh, written and thought about what 
the political consequences of China's many faceted bid to establish its influence in the Middle East might look like. And if you're talking to your fellow Turks, Turkish citizens and, and other Muslim leaders in, in the Gulf and elsewhere in the Middle East, what do you see as the long-term implications of, of unrestrained um, uh, Chinese uh, influence on the political norms of the Middle East, not just in Turkey, but the, but the, but the West Asia writ large? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think China uh, is building and representing and promoting a world order where state power has no limits. And, and uh, there are no concepts like human rights that are internationally valued. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is appealing to leaders like MBS, you know, that uh, or other autocratic rulers in the in the Muslim world, because what, what basically what China is saying is that uh, we don't we think these are all internal matters of countries and no internal domestic affairs of countries should be ever brought up by others. Uh, countries have their own thing. So that is that is a language of the dictators of the Muslim world, too. That's why actually they like this narrative. I mean, they themselves don't want to be criticized by a Human Rights Watch report or by some uh, NGO or, or by an article in New York Times or Wall Street Journal for their human rights violations. Well, uh, China is presenting them a world and, and a value system where the state authority is absolute and, 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 and it can really design society in the way they want, which is very appealing to uh, some of the leaders in, in, in the Muslim majority world or elsewhere who wants to stay in power forever and want to design their societies accordingly. Um, but for Muslim peoples and, and intellectuals and NGOs and ordinary people, th this is why it should be incredibly concerning. Uh, because if you have a, and, and China is adding to this totalitarianism an incredible high tech element, right? So, I mean, Soviet Union was totalitarian, but you know, it couldn't, it couldn't have face recognition cameras. And so China is adding an incredibly new 21st cutting edge dimension to its totalitarianism, which can be exported. And China, when it sees Islam, it can go after this. In, in a Muslim majority country, it won't be Islam per se for sure, but it will be a certain sect or a certain group or a certain minority. And you can employ Chinese methods to get rid of these people uh, or to transform these people and engineer your society. And again, I see the uh, attraction it has for dictators and autocrats in, in four, four corners of the world, including the Muslim world. But that is precisely why we should see. And I think uh, in my article too, one thing I brought up is that there was a lot of criticism of Islamophobia in Western societies in, in, Muslim, society, in Muslim majority countries. Like when you go to Pakistan, they speak about Islamophobia. In Turkey and Pakistan, actually, I, I think, leading an effort to criticize and map Islamophobia in, in, in France and in, in Europe. And, and there are elements of Islamophobia in Western societies, so of course. Sometimes it comes as an attack, so sometimes as some wrong legislation that inter interferes in religious freedom, and I'm critical of those. But see what happens when Islamophobia becomes state policy in a state like China. It's not that the government is acting a little bit prejudiced way or limiting a few things. You end up in a concentration camp and they're brainwashing you and your child is taken away from you. So that's why, uh, I mean, in my piece, there's a final thing. Is it good for Muslims? Like what is good for Muslims? I mean, people, I mean, we, Muslims or any other religious, I think, community in the world, we should aspire for a world order where people are secure from authoritarian governments and they can practice their religion and preserve their identity as they want and they are safe from arbitrary power and let's criticize western governments when they sometimes exercise arbitrary power but let's not forget that there are checks and balances in those countries when there is some uh human rights violations in guantanamo you read about it in the western media and you can criticize it and you can protest that and things can change right but when China establishes worse camps for a million people, Chinese media doesn't say anything about that. And you can't learn about it and you can't change it. And, and that's why totalitarianism uh, is very dangerous. And in China, we're seeing a totalitarianism with, with Islamophobia as its state policy. And, 
uh, and that's, I think, why those authoritarian elements in the Muslim world doesn't want to look to this way, because when they look at this, all their worldview, which criticize only the West and, and, and Western influence and want to preserve their own power with Chinese-like methods will collapse. But that's why it's important. I think it's globally significant. Yeah, thanks. Nori, do you have any final thoughts on that? Um, you know, a lot of the same technological tools that are being used to subjugate uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang are in fact being exported all over the world. Uh, in many respects, you could say that the Xinjiang model is being exported by the PRC to secondary states, not just in the Middle East, but in Latin America and beyond. What do you see as the long range implications of that? I, I, um, I, I am a, I'm an optimist by nature, but this is something it's so hard to be an optimistic about. In light of the fact that uh, there are 100, more than 150 state parties to the genocide convention, only eight, including France, uh, have spoken out and taken a position. So the article one of the genocide convention specifically states, whenever genocide occurs uh, as a signatory, a state party to the genocide convention, you must call it out and you stop it and punish. So those eight countries, including our, uh, our own, only have done the step one. And this genocide, it's in its fifth year. And people are still debating whether or not this is a genocide. Uh, some academics, including some think tank experts here in Washington, still trying to whitewash. And, uh, and also politicians uh, here at home uh, in Europe, for example, in Australia with sizable Uyghur population have not really put out a plan. What is the plan? What do you have in mind that you wanted to do? Uh, so, you know, this is no longer about the Uyghurs. Uh, this is no longer just a typical uh, or a, 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 a human rights uh, concern or fight that uh, we have known. Um, Mustafa is right in saying in 2009, it was a, a the worst forms of uh, human rights abuses, but it was not a, a genocide we know today, but the international community did not pay attention when the Uyghur activists were sounding the alarm, look, this is not, this does not look good. If the guy who, whom you hosted in the United States Senate, uh, Zhang Chunshen, uh, tells uh, the police force that he can punish on the spot, this is not right. But this guy came to Washington at the invitation of some senators walking through the halls of US Congress and trying to normalize their behavior. This is what happens when you uh, look the other way. This is exactly the, the type of problem that in a national security uh, humanitarian perspective, you need to take a bold step to prevent. The human rights, religious freedom often takes a second, uh, the backseat in a broader policy discussion, simply because some policymakers think that's not that important, but guess what, this becomes a natural uh, uh, national security disaster if you're not properly addressed. We have had um, experienced three genocides in 10 years alone, Yazidis, uh, Rohingya Muslims, and now the Uyghurs. What has the international community has done? Literally nothing. So who would be the next victim? Is that, are we gonna be worrying about the Muslims in Assam of India? So what, uh, so it's, it's a guts, uh, it, you know, it's a soul searching moment for, for the international community. If never again means anything to all any of us, we must act. This is not acceptable. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Mustafa, Nuri, it's great to see you. Uh, let's do this again sometime. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>